clinical decision making is really, really important. It's the hallmark of any EMS provider at any level. Really, almost more important than knowledge. As a matter of fact, this is based on knowledge. The way that we make clinical decisions and how we do them is so important. And it's why the National Registry is actually like the street. So I'm going to put up two questions. Now, these two questions, I'm going to do one after the other. And they're questions about cardiology and nitroglycerin, probably one of the more uh, questioned clinical topics. It seems like the Heart Association changes the guidelines every so often, and the way people interpret them, you know, can be kind of rigid. So I'm going to put up these questions. They're also multiple response questions, where you will choose two quest two, two choices out of the five that are presented. And the reason I'm doing this is because people are telling me they're getting a lot of these questions. So therefore, it's important that I give you these questions for practice. There is your question. Now, these questions do take longer. I don't want to push you. All right. All right, let's take a look. This 56-year-old patient wants to take a nitroglycerin. They have slight respiratory distress and clear lung sounds. So they want to take another nitroglycerin. So it sounds like they took one. They have slight respiratory distress, clear lung sounds, pulse of 118, respiratory rate of 16, 106 on 86, setting at 94%. Which of the following actions should the EMT do based on the patient's condition and the request? Select the two options that are correct. So, and that's exactly the way the National Registry is going to phrase it. Select the two options that are correct. All right, this is how we do it. So, administer a second nitroglycerin, withhold nitroglycerin, administer oxygen by nasal cannula, apply continuous positive airway pressure, or place the patient supine. Now, I'll start with the correct answers. The correct answers are choice B like boy and C like Charlie. Withhold nitroglycerin, and administer oxygen by nasal cannula. Now, why is that? Why are we withholding nitroglycerin? If you look at this and say, well, gee, his, his systolic is 106, it meets my protocols, you're missing a couple of important things. The first is the tachycardia, the pulse of 118. Now, that doesn't always mean we can't give it, but it certainly makes me worry a little bit. The second thing is the pulse pressure. The pulse pressure is narrow. That indicates compensated shock, especially with the tachycardia. So the pulse pressure should be at least 25% of the systolic blood pressure, which means it should be at least 26 or 27. But you subtract 86 from 106, you're only getting 20. So you've got a narrowed pulse pressure. Now that 86 rising up means that you've got some vasoconstriction going on to help maintain the blood pressure along with that tachycardia and that's increasing his cardiac output. You give a nitroglycerin, boom, this patient bottoms out. Their blood pressure tanks and they crash. That's the problem. Now, acute coronary syndrome, the oxygen level that's considered hypoxia is 90%. So based on 94 alone, you'd say, I'm not going to give oxygen. However, because he's in compensated shock, most likely compensated cardiogenic shock, some oxygen by nasal cannula is appropriate. And because he has respiratory distress. So the respiratory distress and the potential for shock say a little oxygen is probably a good thing. But did you pick up the fine points of that tachycardia and the narrow pulse pressure indicating compensated shock? Did you get that? All of that is something you can get from this question. Now, 
people say, oh, the National Registry is nothing like the street. But this is a real situation. You could get this patient. This patient, now, let's look at the wrong answers. Administer a second nitroglycerin, no, he's going to tank if you give it to him. Apply CPAP, well, he does have respiratory distress, but his lung sounds are clear and he's a little bit shocky. That rules out CPAP. Placing the patient supine, well, you say, okay, he's a little shocky, but he has respiratory distress. You lay him flat, his respiratory distress gets worse. That means choice B and C are the most appropriate. I gave you a challenging question here. This is a question that I want you, whether you're an EMT or a paramedic, this is the kind of decision, the kind of material you're going to have to identify in a question to be able to make the right decisions. I took the Paramedic National Registry in January, and this is real. This is fair game. The National Registry wants you to think that way. I worked actually all morning on this question with one of our employees who was a former exam coordinator at the National Registry to come up with a question that's tight, that the distractors, the incorrect answers, have some potential, right, to really be able to make you think. All right. I have no comments on that, so let's put up another question. Then we'll talk about our teaching points. Here's the next question. This is going to take a little time. There's a lot on here. This is multiple response where we select the two answer options that are correct. Every once in a while, you will get National Registry style questions that you just have to read. There's a lot of reading and you probably have to read them twice, you know, just to be sure. One of the ways to, to look at questions like this is pick out the ones that you know you're not going to give nitroglycerin to. You know there's some that you're just going to be able to get rid of. The next uh, slide I'm going to put up is going to talk about the things I want you to think about when you get these nitroglycerin questions. All right, so here we go. All the following patients complain of chest pain and they have prescribed nitroglycerin. Now, again, if you're a paramedic and you're doing this, you have nitroglycerin or AMT, you've got your own nitroglycerin, right? You've got to decide who should get that nitroglycerin, who shouldn't. Which of the answer options have a clear indication for the use of nitroglycerin? Select the two answer options that are correct. Now, the correct answers here are choice A, like Adam, and B, like boy. Incorrect is C. Choice C, this 88-year-old popped a Viagra about an hour ago. I think we figured out how he got his chest pain. And that's an instant no-go. So choice C is ruled out. Choice D, systolic blood pressure of 88. That's an instant rule out. So we got rid of D. Choice E, reproducible pain after falling and hitting your chest. We don't give nitroglycerin for trauma, right? So C, D, and E are ruled out. That leaves choice A and B. Now, did you get those? Were you able to go through? Now, if you didn't get this, now, if you did get this, you probably used some of the rationale that I did. Because remember, there's two ways to get a question correct. One is to know the correct answer or answers. And the other is to know that there's, in this case, three of them that aren't the answer. The Viagra patient, the person with a systolic blood pressure of 88, and the patient with trauma, you rule those out, it only leaves two. So if I was taking the test, I'd say, okay, it looks like A and B. Do they make sense? Right, choice A, right, 71 years old, has difficulty breathing, pulse is reasonable, blood pressure is acceptable. Okay, A is good. Choice B, 68, chest pain continues, took it eight minutes ago. All right, so still fair game because it's five minutes apart. Pulse is 88, 118 over 82, mm, wide enough pulse pressure. Uh, okay, so A and B fit and C, D, and E don't. That's the kind of thinking I want you to use. Now, all this being said, here are the general, I don't like to use the word rules because there are no rules. I want you to make your decisions based on the patient presentation. Not, well, gee, the my instructor said this or my protocols are this, right, Matthew? 
because you can't use anything because everybody's protocol is different. So the National Registry, if you notice in those questions, the systolic blood pressure was 88. It doesn't matter if your protocols are 90 or 100 or 110, right? It doesn't matter. And also, if you look at this, other clear things that rule it out. So the National Registry doesn't, doesn't know your protocols. It can't match everyone's protocols, but they write questions so they're transparent to all protocols. Generally, we use three nitroglycerin, given nitro, see how it goes. Nitro gets in the system pretty quickly sublingually. We generally start to feel an effect in about two minutes. And that's why we go for five minutes to see if it's had an effect. And we can give another one in five minutes and another one five more minutes, as long as the vital signs stay good. Now, use caution in tachycardia and bradycardia. In 2010 or 2015, the Heart Association said those things were contraindications. They've since lightened that up a little bit, right? The reason they're concerned about tachycardia and bradycardia, like in that first question I gave you, that pulse, remember the pulse was 118, but the pulse pressure was narrow? That pulse of 118 is helping that blood pressure stay up there because of that compensated shock. So tachycardia may mean shock. And if we give a nitroglycerin a patient with shock and we wipe out some of their vascular tone, they could crash. That's why we have to be careful about tachycardia. Not an instant thing, because could a patient have chest pain, be worried about dying, and that's why they have a pulse of 104? Sure. But could it also be shock? It could be. Bradycardia, it's a cardiac output issue. If you've got a pulse of 40, your heart's not putting out as much blood as it should. Nitroglycerin could lower the blood pressure with, in combination with that bradycardia. So I want you to think about those things and be cautious. Now, the American Heart Association in a very recent paper said that the blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters of mercury or 30 millimeters of mercury less than baseline. So let's say the patient's normally 150 over 90. I've got hypertension, I've got it down a little bit, but the doctor says, you know, I'm 140, 150 over 90, I can't do it. I'm like, okay, wait a minute, if I take 30 off a of baseline, 110 to 120 might still be a time I'd want to use caution. Now, let's look for other signs of shock too. Pulse pressure, skin, color, temperature, and condition. Maybe the patient's a little anxious. Look for other things that may indicate instability and might make you want to be careful. Now, I've given a lot of nitroglycerin in my day, and I've had people um, crash. Right now, most of the time I've done it as a paramedic. So what do you do if the patient crashes? You put the head of the stretcher down, get perfusion to their brain, right? And if you are an advanced life support person, open up your IV a little bit, see if you can get them. And generally we can fix that, right? But we want to try and avoid that if we can. I think that's really, really important. We're going to combine all of these things to make our decision. Yeah, Matthew, fluid, give him some fluid. Now listen to the any, anytime you're giving a cardiac patient fluid, I was amazed. I was I was working, when was it? I don't know, a month or two ago. And then somebody said, I'm gonna open up the IV. I said, have you listened to their lungs yet? Right? You don't want to to do that if you haven't listened to their lungs, right? Because you don't want to dump a ton of fluid if they've already got fluid in their lungs, yet you also don't want to be hypotensive. So everything is ultimately a balance. And a good class gets you to the point where you can make those decisions. So if you, someone, now if this patient had, Matthew, say you're a medic, and uh, taken a medic test, and these lungs did have uh, fine crackles or rails, you'd have to be saying, well, I might do some fluid, but I want to be cautious. Um, or if it continues, maybe think about a presser. 